Chair. Terrific. Thanks. Senator Stirl. Thanks, Chair. I just want to go to the $2 billion road safety program. So that was announced on the 6th of October of uh, this uh, of last year, I should say. So um, to, to be delivered over 18 months commencing January 2021. So we're talking about delivering upgrades to 3,000 kilometres of roads, and we're going to do some new shoulder ceiling rumble strips, uh, medium treatments to prevent head-on collisions and barriers to prevent runoff road crashes and protect against roadside hazards. Great. So. Uh, the program will be delivered on my right in three and six month tranches. That's correct. On a use it or lose it basis. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, which requires the jurisdictions to provide road safety data as a key condition of funding. Tremendous. Can the department provide a copy of the funding criteria used to administer the two billion road safety program, including specifics of the road safety data required to be provided by jurisdictions? I'll get Ms O'Neill to. Okay. That, if that's okay. Gabby O'Neill, Assistant Secretary, Head of uh, the Office of Road Safety. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, yes, I th we have already published the data that is required, I think, in response to a question on notice, but we will provide that to you. Oh, you've got all that, have you? So that's the data provided and when? What is the data and when? You've yes. done all that? Yes, okay. so that's part of their milestones. Oh, to, to okay, provide great. That as part of that, yes. Beautiful. So if it's done, just cut me off. So uh, can you let us know how the use it or lose it provisions are to be assessed and enforced? Yes, I can. So at the moment, we've got um, a number of programs <coughs> underway and they need to complete all of their milestones and do all of their projects within the, um, within the funding. And then unless in, in exceptional circumstances, you know, such as COVID or extreme mm -hmm. weather conditions such as we're experiencing now. So yeah. if construction activity cannot be completed during the time frame within that tranche that it was nominated for within that project, or a jurisdiction doesn't spend their allocation within that time frame, we're looking at their future allocations and have those reduced to proportion. Okay. So we're holding them to account through a funding That's mechanism. Yeah. In the first question you were asked, how many jurisdictions have provided the data on time in full? The data isn't due yet. It's due towards the end of the tranche. It's one of the milestones. It's, it's so the end of tranche is how long? Each tranche is six months long. And so in six months' time, they've got to give you the data to underpin the finance? Yes. Thanks. Right. So, uh, so can you let us know also the process through which states and territories apply for funds for individual sites or loca all locations and any requirements for independent validation that these are indeed the best value for money in that state or territory? So they all put, put together their projects and put them forward to us and we did a, sort of a three criteria analysis whether it's eligible under the National Land Transport Act. Um, whether it complies with the eligibility criteria in the normal circumstances. And then we went through to check that they were road safety projects. So assessing them against with, where they saw the gap, what's the gap, you know, the network wide gap. So right. where do we need um, these? What is the current rate of fatal and serious injury or is it a change in risk? Because as you know, the crashes don't always happen in the same places. So is it a risk that it's, um, that they're trying to reduce or is it, um, sort of a known area of fatal and serious, but we are looking for corridor length treatments, not just spot treatments, so that we can reduce the risk over long lengths of roads. So we went through that process to assess whether a risk existed and what, we, what sort of outcomes that we think could be achieved from that. All right, so I mean, I've got a series of questions around, but have any shovels been turned yet? Yes. Oh, OK. Well, I'll get to that. All right. Good. Good. That's what I want to hear. So, the, so you could also let us know the criteria and process by which individual sites or locations are selected. So I might say on, that... Yeah, so touched on, yeah, who so is the decision maker? That's where I wanted to lead to. Oh, so the decision maker is the Deputy Prime Minister. So we do an assessment. My God, I hope he's more awake than he is in the shipping and rail area. OK. Let's, let's, do, you sorry, know, he's, the, he's the final decision maker of the... Oh. The program, yes. Sorry, can I go okay. back? The mm -hmm. Prime Minister makes these decisions. Deputy, Deputy Prime, Prime Minister. Minister. Okay. Given that it's shoulder ceiling, rumble strips, 
Ah, line separation. What is the decision he makes? There are thousands of kilometres of arterial roads that require these, you know, treatments. Can I just help hey. with that? So he's formally the decision maker under the legislation, and I so... I can't hear this, mate. Yeah, yeah, really? yeah, hard to hear, Mr. Ackers. That's not something I usually get accused of, to be honest. Um, so the, the Deputy Prime Minister is the decision maker under the land transport legislation, and so the proposals come through and assessed for compliance, and then the, the DPM is the person who agrees them under the legislation. OK, but, I mean, Ben would tell me that there's $2 billion worth of work ready to go in New South Wales right now. So... What is it that, that so you do? So we're agreeing. The, the DPM signed off. How sure, much sure but what, is he, what does he do? So there's been over 698 projects signed off. So each Individually? Not individually. A program of works goes up. So yeah. for each state and territory, so they put forward a program of potential projects. We assess them for their eligibility and to make sure that they're road safety projects. And then we put those state programs up to the Deputy Prime Minister for his signature. So there's a whole program of um, projects. And so each state has a number of um, individual ones. So, you know, in, in the ACT, there were 38. In New well, South not, sorry, Ms. O'Neill, I might make it easy for you. You can table the, the whole 693. Is that easier? Happy to, Rather yeah. than sit there, yeah. you can break it up for us in state. I don't think the numbers. Oh, OK. No, but we yeah. can certainly forward those 600, through the There are 693 that have been signed off. How many of it? 698, yeah. 698? Yeah. And how many are actually underway? There are... 641 have commenced. 641, This is okay. at, as at February. I think in the last few weeks there, there have been more. But of the actual construction, you know, shovels and... Yep. People on the ground, 96, and there are nine completed. Oh, sorry. So, sorry, 641 as of February, but 96 have started. To commence construction. Commence construction. W what about the other 570 or whatever, quick stuff, 30? Are they just ticked off? They're agreed? Uh, no? More than that. They're undergoing either procurement or design and planning, you know, so they're getting their way to being <clears throat> shovels. Oh, yeah. So there yeah. are 96 with shovels and graders, etc. Right. And there are nine completed. Nine completed? Yes. All right, that's good. So you'll be able to break it all up for a state by state jurisdiction? Yes, You know, yes. seat by seat, whatever it might picture. be? Yep. OK. But this is seamless. There's no new stuff here. This is proven technology that works and you just put money onto it. So is it going quick enough? Well, it was only started at the start of January and we've got... A you know, at this point, we've got really good progress. Okay. We're, so we're should. hoping to get the whole so lot done. Because we're decades change. behind. We're decades behind in this work. We know this stuff works. Save lives, saves injuries, and there are too many injuries and lives lost. We're very, very happy for this program and to get it moving as fast as we can. And I think this program has also really put the focus on road safety, you know, rather than, um, you know, it's really made agencies put it front of mind to make sure that they've got that focus and are pushing it out. Yeah, 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 so that's what we want to see. We actually want to see it rather than, you know, a headline, which we can't, we can't follow up. And if you provide all that detail, what actually has been spent, where, on what and all that, and that'll give us, well, we'd like to put it on a map and see how it's going. Is there some states that aren't doing as well as others? Or you, you can break that all up for us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it'd be a very busy map, but yes. Be fun. It would be a very busy map if you put 700 <laughs> projects on it. Oh, yeah, I know, but you can put a map and put how many yeah, have been I done know. in it. You see, yeah. see what Senator Gallagher and I see every year is 1,200 deaths. Yeah. We see 30,000 every year, him more than me, he used to be a commissioner for crying out loud. Uh, and, you know, and it just frustrates us, but if we can see it all yeah. laid out, who's getting what and what for, um, yeah, we'll it, put it all just, that through. It, it does, does help us. It's a very good program, this one. Well, in, in that case, we should be talking about it. It should be four billion. Not that I should give policy views on government, but... I didn't pull you up at all. Even <laughs> <quite happy. laughs> the chair, I I'm happy to hear. So you let us know the information available for consultation on the National Road Safety Strategy 
21 to 32 that states the 5.5 million National Road Safety Data Hub will be delivered over the course for four years. Can you, can you, you know, um, enlighten us on that? Yeah, so the draft strategy, the strategy that's out for consultation, it's still out for consultation. Consultation will close tomorrow. We've had that out for four weeks. So prior to drafting the strategy, we had, you know, a lot of our key road safety stakeholders come in and help us refine the priorities. We've drafted the strategy. We've got that out for consultation at the moment. I've had 10 public sort of offerings for people just to come and zoom in, ask questions, clarify anything. And I've also done some one-on-one -on -one meetings with perhaps the more, uh, the, the really key stakeholders, like, like the college, like the AAA, you know, like all the, the big... And I was going to ask that, Miss O'Neill, who are the experts that you are consulting? And, and you can take it on notes, or you can tell us, but it's easy, you know who you're consulting. How often you meet? So, in this, in, once the strategy was out, obviously we met with the co-chairs of the inquiry. Great. You know, um, yep. you know one, to let them know that, that it's there, and obviously we met them prior to sort of help shape it as well. And then, um, <coughs> you know, we pulled it together, we've put it out, and we've met them sort of one-on-one -on -one just to say, how do you think we're tracking? Is the direction right? Because we want to get a sense from them as well, you know. Um, and, you know, we get some texts and we get some, maybe we'll provide advice in our written submissions, you know, to strengthen it in, in or an area where you might need more emphasis. But as I say, it closes tomorrow and we're expecting written submissions and we'll go through those and then adjust, I think, the what we put out. Because obviously, when you get more information, you can make it better. Yeah. Why does it take four years to do a data hub? I mean, I'm... I'm oh, no, the data hub is up and running. Right. So the da we got, we're, we're so grateful we got money stood up for the data hub in the last budget in October. Right. And so we've released the serious injury baseline against a national definition just um, at the end of last week. So obviously we wanted to get that out. Um, that's a huge piece of work that needs to be done. So we've set a baseline for the strategy going forward. We're using um, the Bureau. I think Dr Rawlings is here if you wanted to ask her specific questions. Well, but why does it take so long to get it up and running? We've well, it is up and running and we've got uh, new dashboards. What up. are you delivering over four years? Over four years, I intend to have... Um, as the data matures, an understanding of the risk that has changed in regards to the road safety program. So how effective are we being? How many lives have we saved? How has the risk reduced? I'm expecting to get greater insights into serious injuries so we know what crash types we need to prevent. And I'm looking to see if we can reduce the length of stay for hospitalisations. Like, it takes time to get the data. It's all, it's not harmonised. That's our first sort of business is to get the data harmonised so I can get an understanding of a national picture. And you know the sad part about this, Ms O'Neill, is we had this ability to do that, but when the Howard government uh, chopped the legs off the Office of Road Safety. So we understand that, but, you know, this is not new. And we know some of the states do it good and some do it terrible. But as Senator Gallagher, with his frustration and mine as well, as we know the failed, the last national road safety strategy failed, the words of the experts, they were scathing. And Senator Gallagher and I welcomed, we welcomed that the Deputy Prime Minister engaged with Dr Crozier and Professor Woolley with support from Mr McEnany and Mr McIntosh. Thank goodness. Um, and that, but what I wanted to see was we saw the report that came out. A lot of it was kicked, kicked, kicked down the road there. And we've asked many questions here in Senator Esmond. Say, are you engaging with them? And I'd asked Professor Woolley and Dr Crozier and a couple of times early in the piece where they said, no, hardly even the crickets. So we are keen to see actually how you are, because it's not being rude. They are the imminent experts. There's, yep. there's no argument about that. And, and I struggle because I point back to that magnificent report. It's all there. And it's in, in my eyes, it's easy to fix with the political will. That's, that's... I'd say I've got a pretty strong relationship with the chairs of the inquiry. And that um, certainly do... Um, seek to listen to them and understand how we can improve. Yep. Um, so they've been really valuable in helping us shape it, telling us where we need to do better, obviously, but, um, you know, we are working with them. Good. It's, I feel very um, strongly about yep. that and would say that we have a good relationship with them. Good. So how does the data from the Two Billion Road Safety Program feed into the National Road Safety Strategy? So the data will tell us what we're 
targeting and if what we're targeting is making a difference um, and really what is the most effective use of the money so we want to you know because we want to get the things that are working fast out the most but, we... but sorry miss o'neill but that money when, when, when will you actually have the money the money for the road safety strategy and, and the program Oh, I think we're uh, working... I mean, you'll get the data, sorry to cut you off. The, the yeah. data. The, the experts will tell you the data and it'll be all proved right too. But um, so. so I think, you know, we're just working in the background to work with the government around what we're going to need over the life of this strategy and that's just not determined yet. When do you think it will be returned? Stranger in the house, there's a former senator at the back. <laughs> former Senator Edwards, hello. Long time since you've been in estimates here in this room. Thank sorry, Miss O'Neill, he, he detracted me. Um, so when are we going to have it? So, sorry, work, work. Could I have data. when we have all the data. Oh, okay, sorry, keep okay. going. Well, we're yeah. trying to get the national road strategy. We yeah. know that you're rolling out. Yeah. Okay, you're starting to do the road and, safety. So and we're doing, doing the road safety investment now. Yeah, well, no, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if you've got sorry. 21 to 30, and your data will only be available in 25, how does that help you? Louise? Sorry, I didn't, sorry, can't sorry hear. I didn't hear that properly. You want to lean into the mic, Alex? Can't hear you, mate. So you, you said it'd be four years before the data is in place at the hub? I don't, I don't think we said that. No, no, we've got some data now and we have done oh, no, some... No, hang on, you did. You said to get all the jurisdictions together, and it'll be about four years before all the data's in the hub with injuries and the like. Well, I, I, I apologise, Senator, because that we have some data now and we have a large number of data sets that we're pulling together. There are individual data sets in the states and territories which we are trying to pull together. There is harmonisation work to be done to make sure the data sets are, you know, we're comparing like with like. So that's work that needs to be done. Um, I don't think that's going to take four years. But you're funded for four years to do it. We are funded for four years. We, we have four years of funding for the hub across the Ford estimates. It's ongoing funding. Right. Yeah. And so the we're funded going to be the available when? Well, uh, as Ms O'Neill was saying, there's some now. Um, Up to four years' time? No, well, now. Louise Rawlings, Head of the Bureau of Infrastructure and Transport Research Economics. Um, Gabby O'Neill and I have been working closely to set up a project board to guide the uh, Road Safety Data Hub and we've had two meetings already to guide the project. We've had some real progress around, as um, Ms O'Neill says, our early focus has been on the serious injury data set. We've kicked off a cost of road crashes study. We've done a data gaps analysis. We're working on getting better visualisation of our existing data holdings that the Bureau has. So. We're definitely focused on making progress. So know, it's a simple question. You've got a 10 year plan. The underpinning data has been collected. When will it be available to oh, okay. focus the plan? I would imagine as the program data comes in over the next sort of six months, we'll do some quick analysis and get something out there in the public domain over the next six to 12 month period, giving insights into what's happening with that program data. Definitely won't take four years. Okay. Okay, so don't go away, Doc. Are you a doctor, Dr Rawlings? Yes. Okay, all right. So we haven't got six to 12 months. All right, well, let's move on to projection of road fatalities and serious injuries, okay? So, Bitter, and could you mention Bitter? Okay, so you're working on those future projections. Um, to 2030, is that correct? So those projections are part of the uh, next strategy. But uh, we do report on our fatalities and serious injuries as they happen. Yes. Okay, and like Senator Gallagher says, we're we're 2021 now. We're getting to 20, you know, uh, uh, to the end of 2021. And you say about sorry, but by the time about six to 12 months comes up, the the reality is we'll be nearly in 2022 before we start getting to it. And I remember the criticism that came by the experts last time when the strategy fell over, and that was them. No, they really made a noise of it. So do you? forecast any further past 2030 or will you forecast past 2030? We haven't been doing forecasts beyond 2030. We have done the serious injury baseline, which is sort of our longest forecast at the moment around, well, that's a national serious injury baseline of 40,472 serious injuries. 
40,000. Yes, 40,472. How many deaths are you forecasting? Uh, the baseline for the new strategy, I might defer to Ms O'Neill. The current number of deaths is 1124 to the, to the end of February 2021. Yeah. So I imagine any reduction on that will be, you know, will be from the commencement of the strategy. The, the baseline figure is... Fourteen hundred and twenty. Sorry, no, that was the the previous one. Um, I'll have to give you that on notice. I think because it's not clear to me here the baseline for the strategy. Um, All right. Can you tell me then why you don't go past twenty thirty? Why we don't forecast out the twenty forty or twenty fifty? It's pretty rubbery. So, so our, this is so is this our is our, so so. I, I, sorry for the language. Um, no, no. The, You've got, you watch your language, you're talking to a truck driver. A 10 year forecast is, you know, <coughs> pardon me, a long way into the future. Look, I understand, but we just keep <coughs> slipping up and failing. That's what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Would it, would it not be better then? Let me ask this question. Would it not be better to focus more on trying to look into the future rather than the past? I mean, we know what's happened. We've got all the figures. We, we bury people and, and that's easy to count. And then we think we, we injure, you know, 30,000 in Maine. Would that not be... I'm also More focusing on, on acting now. Oh, you... Mr. Mr. Atkinson, you won't get an argument from me. But I ask, would it not be? Well, yeah, we're talking on acting now, but we can't even get the figures out here probably six, 12 months, which could be anything we don't know. I'm just asking a simple question. Would that not be better to look into the future? I, I think and tomorrow's part of the future. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but a 10-year forecast is, um, you know, a fairly normal thing. So what I will ask is, you can't provide us with anything yet, but when you do, when you can give us the, 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 <coughs> the thoughts, we would be keen to see how that, as would the road, ex, the road safety experts. Okay. I Don't you want to say something, please, Dr. Rawlings? I might add Professor Russell Gruen from the ANU is on our uh, project board for the road safety data. Who is? Professor Russell Gruen, who's a close colleague of uh, Dr. Crozier, is on our project board to guide the project. Okay. All right. Well, I want to move into now one of my favourite areas that I want to talk about. And I want to paint a picture again. And I'm going to go to uh, Austrac. The Austrac report. The, surf, uh, the uh, uh, um, heavy vehicle rest area strategy. Now, as someone who's spent a fair bit of time in heavy vehicle uh, rest areas, I'm going to ask some questions now and I'm going to show something. And I'm going to ask on behalf of Australia's female truck drivers and our men. Let's just paint the picture. It's freezing cold. They're out the back of New South Wales, out in the outback somewhere. The nearest roadhouse is probably 200 k away. It's pouring down with rain. Paint the picture. Shut your eyes if you want to. And they've been on the road for a couple of days. They've been on the road for three or four days, maybe a week. Thundering along in their truck, cutting millions of dollars worth of gear around our nation. And all of a sudden, they've got a shocking tummy ache. This might not be pleasant. But this is life for our Australia's long distance truck drivers. Could we imagine what it would be like if I said to you people, if you want to have a toilet break, I'm not picking on you, men and women, down the road here to the state circle. Plenty of bush, find yourself a nice shady bush if it's sunny, hope there's not a lot of flies in there. And I know it sounds crass, but this is what our truckies do day in and day out. Put your, put your shorts on a, on, a, on a branch where you hope they don't fall in the mud. Do your business and hope the crikey you don't fall back in it. As terrible as that sounds, isn't that shocking? This is what our truckies go through every single day of their life. And we wonder why we can't attract women to the transport industry. And my frustration after all these years is, is not waning. But I know that Oz track. I've got the torch here because it's night time too. I hope the Christ you don't walk on a snake or something else. Yeah, I, so I'm sorry, there you go. Look, it's, it's a torch. See, there it is there. So our truckies pull over. Now, they can read all sorts of reports if it's brought to them. They've been screaming for years, when can we get fit for purpose facilities for our truckies? Where can we get showers? Where can we get access to toilets? Now, I don't expect, and neither do our truckies, that there would be a fit for purpose um, truck bay every five kilometres. And I have a solution, but I want to ask you guys, where are we going? 
We're talking about how do we get these these areas, not only not only for our truckies, but even if we've got the areas, walking into the bush in 2021 with a light and hope the cross you don't fall into a, or step on something that you might bite you. I look at the preamble of the Austrack Heavy Vehicle Road Safety Authority. Now, Austrack are fully funded by the government, correct? Do you mean Austroads? Austroads, Aus Aus sorry, not Austrack, Austroads. Correct? I think it's joint to the states. Are they? Yeah, it's joint to the states and uh, New Zealand as well. So. So, so, how much funding do they attract? And I don't know the answer. I don't. If you know that, if you don't know, you can take it on those. Well, I'll take it on notice as easy. All right. So when you read their preamble, that they they mention, you know, back in 2019, Oz Roads produced a publication titled Guidelines for Provision of a Heavy Vehicle Rest Area Facilities. The publication draws on and provides an update to the 2005 National Transport Commission guidelines. And all the way through it says, it says things like may involve talking to transport industry uh, experts may involve talking to truck drivers to, to develop heavy road vehicle strategy. You know, uh, stakeholders could manage development, could not if. It's a really very flossy sort of thing. So I want to ask a couple of questions around that while our truckies are listening in. Local and state governments and developers have been identified to prioritise the Heavy Vehicle Road Safety Authority. Sites that will meet fatigue management objectives, this is what it says in the preamble, including those suitable for commercial development. None of, that's obviously road houses. OK. Is Osroads... Uh, so, so, sorry, where have we got to? Can someone point me to a heavy vehicle road strategy that involves transport operators, men and women, truck drivers, and what have we done? We've got individual projects. We don't have a strategy as far as I'm aware, but we are funding projects under the Road Safety Program in Northern Territory and Queensland. And through the Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity Program, there's a number of um, truck stops and rest stops also being upgraded or newly. So, OK, so if you could list those for me and tell me how much we spent, where are they, who was consulted? You see, because having a roadhouse is one thing, but I've got to tell you, some of the conditions of the roadhouses are absolutely disgusting, we know that. We saw what happened when COVID came in for our truckies. Trust me on this, my phone went red hot when overzealous enforcers was kicking the truckies out. We had two up, two up teams running together, men and women and blokes together, sleeping in the same bunk, not at the same time, one behind the steering wheel, pulling into a roadhouse, weren't allowed to sit and even eat together. This is the nonsense that's going on. For some of the photos that have come across my desk of the condition of some of the roadhouse, I wouldn't even dare bring it in here because it put me off me dinner. So coming back to where we are in 2021, what are we going to do for our truck drivers? How are we going to give them somewhere where it's safe for them, talk to them when they need to and provide them with toilets, provide them with the opportunity for a shower? And I do use that, I don't say this tongue in cheek, at my age now, I'm getting too old with the uh, light and the toilet paper under the arm. Thank God when I come off the road, my knees were all right. What are we going to do? So we have been pursuing you, these on a project... Sorry, Mr Atkinson, and you've been good, you've been listening. We've got a couple of roadhouses. So BP and Caltex can, you know, and, and, and you know what happens there, you know what happens there, they get a playground and the McDonald's. And our truckies have got enough health issues without McDonald's. Hang on, that's another whole story where I can go down that path at a later date. Is anyone listening? Is anyone consulting? Do we have a working group with truck drivers on it, men and women, to consult on where we should be building heavy vehicle rest areas? Oh, you're not in trouble. You're not in trouble because this hasn't been brought to your attention. It's just been waffling around out there in, in Austrack land or somewhere else. I'm not so, having a crack at you. So it is an issue that I... It's, it's, it's not, not brought to my attention. It's, it's an issue that I'm aware of. Um, the, uh, there's a number of... It's been raised with me by a number of people. Why, sorry? It's been raised with me by a number of people um, about both availability and the conditions. Um, and it's a, it's a significant issue for the for truck drivers. Um, 
and we did a lot of work through COVID-19 to actually overcome some of those issues of allowing basically certain states to make sure that they let people actually into truck stops and roadhouses because there was a problem in the COVID space with the health authorities. Um, there and, was. And we, a lot of hard work went into resolving that with those state governments. Um, we don't have a comprehensive strategy for this. Um, at the moment, we've been investing in it on a project by project basis, as Ms O'Neill was saying. Um, and, uh, and that comes through uh, with, the, with the heavy vehicle program that we talked about. Um, but at the moment, it's coming through on a um, project by project basis with the states. So, so Mr Atkinson, forgive my, um, my negativity here. So what are the states saying? Because you see, um, half the problem we've got is the states as well, because they're all experts behind their computer, you see. So what are we doing with the states? Do they sit there and identify because truck drivers, men and women, have sat down and said, we need some, I don't know what they're saying, we, we need serious truck bays, we need somewhere we can pull over, we need bitumen, we need lighting, you know, even lighting if we want to change tyres at night, or we want to uh, have a shower. Can someone point me to something that I may have missed? Senator Sadurl, it's Marie Bridger, First Assistant Secretary, Surface Transport. Um, we have been meeting regularly with the states. Most of the focus has been on uh, making sure that we can continue moving freight across borders, and that was our focus predominantly last year, um, given efforts around COVID. Um, uh, and uh, the focus was to make sure um, as you've outlined, that, that we could keep um, trucks, trucks going. And one of those initiatives was to um, make sure opening hours of truck stops were extended. Um, in discussion with the states and industry, these are fortnightly conversations that we have with them at the moment. Um, Ms Bridget, I'm, I'm looking at Bridget. you have with, tell me who you actually have those conversations with, please, because I know the hard work that was done. Yep, Because sure. I was part of it too, but I also know the anger and frustration at our borders. Sure. Um, I'll just see if I can find the list of um, specific attendees, but all of the jurisdictions are represented. Uh, we have a number of uh, industry peak bodies. We have uh, unions represented as well on that conversation. Um, and generally, the, the conversation um, is a bit of an update on how things are working at the border to make sure that freight continues to move across borders, whether there are any <coughs> specific issues that have cropped up over the fortnight. Um, uh, of particular concern has been uh, making sure that um, drivers have access to um, uh, vaccination you know, a vaccination uh, given the timeliness that's required for vaccinations. And that's probably been the, the main issue that we've been working through with them. And we've invited the Department of Health to those conversations yes, Bridget, as well. Um, look, I reckon truckies are the most tested people in, in, uh, and, and our uh, frontline health workers. And I'm so thankful to our front and our frontline health workers. Our truckies finally, after all these years, have been recognised as essential service providers, not to mention our retail workers who put up with a lot of rubbish when, when the public's <coughs> being repulsive. But going back to the problem, this is not a new problem. This, this is not new. Is there any conversations on the state's level that you're having where there is consultation with truck drivers, men and women, to where would be the best place, if there is a pot of money, to start putting in some facilities where they can actually go to the toilet and or have a shower? Um, anything like that? In, that in, Add into the... No, please do. Help me uh, out if there's something or... Well, the heavy... As Ms O'Neill was saying, the Heavy Vehicle Safety and Productivity Program has, has funded 72 new or upgraded rest areas and it's designed for this specific purpose. That's one of our programs. 72, and you'll be able to tell me where they and are? And we can give you yep. the list of those. Yep, yep. Um, in addition to those, we have individual other state-based projects from WA, NT and Queensland. Uh, um, you're talking, so when you said WA, this is the latest announcement by the McGowan government with the Morrison government pot of money. This is the 14, is it $14 million, I think it is, for road train assembly areas in Newman. Uh, Oski's going to get done up. There's something in Northampton, Exmouth, Cogent up, Leonora, that, that project you're talking about? Great Northern Highway. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, long time coming and we're advocating for that and, and, and congratulations to the industry. And then and I did 
say in the Senate the other day, I'll congratulate everyone, and so both governments did, did a great job. Long time coming, but and it shouldn't stop there, but at least they've moved. So I'm aware of that one. And, and so as far as that program goes, we engage with the states on, on those, um, those proposals that the states are putting forward on those, and we have those conversations. Um, I'll take on notice what the conversations are in terms of the, who they're engaging with as they're bringing forward proposals under that program. Um, just to give you more information on that, and we'll give you the full list of all of the projects that relate to this on notice. Thank you. Now, there's also another issue too that can really... I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Senator Stoll. Can I just ask, so yeah, in please. Queensland, could you also provide the list of projects in Queensland? We had evidence the other day there was only 21 dedicated truck stops um, with toilet and shower facilities in Queensland. Yeah, no, that's... It's, it's very, very mixed across the states, as you would know, Senator Stoll. Yeah. Um, but we'll, I'll give you all the, the list of all of them from all the states. Yeah, great. That, that, that we participate in. There may be yeah. things the states do separately. Yeah, that, that would be good. And I know Queensland. Queensland is actually Queensland and Tassie have advanced their their efforts too, and we'll hear about Tassie's effort. So no doubt about that. They're, they're so, all starting at different levels, though, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'll get that. Now, are you aware of Mr. Rod Hanafy from Dubbo? Uh, Does his name come across? I think. You, yes, you, I think yeah. his name has. But so I can't remember exactly. Yeah, no, I'll help you out. So Mr Hanafy is, is an absolute uh, triton of the trucking industry and he, he's a company driver out of Dubbo. Uh, he drives for Rod Piddle and I know uh, Rod very well. Um, and he's had his own thing he's been doing with the green reflector. You remember that? With the yep. green reflectors. Yep. Yep. And I caught up with Rod in Perth not long ago and um, uh, he, uh, he buns at himself, he runs around the nation and finds places that are not actual truck bays, but somewhere where our truckies can pull off safely, whether they have to go to the toilet or whether they have to pull up and have a sleep or whether they have to change a tyre, because this is about road safety for all our road users, because we don't want trucks pulled up half hanging out in lanes. So Rod shows frustration, he can't get any support from state or federal. Where do I point Rod? Where could I, where, where could I point Rod? Who could he talk to? because he has spent a monster of his own money on his holidays, running up highways, putting his green reflectors out that are well known around our nation with no support from anyone. This bloke should be on a pedestal and championed. Yeah. Uh, so I think he should, in the first instance, if he hasn't already, speak to us. I would. Um, but right. also, uh, the, the key thing is we need the states to be proponents on these things as well. So you need to speak to our state colleagues as well. Sure, and the states are the biggest problem because they're the only experts who know about roads, not, not some truck he's been running up and down for 40 years of his life, but I will come and you may be able to help me. We might get some critic, you know, somewhere to be able to go. Now, one thing I want to raise with you, Australian design rules, can I talk about this? Because you see, um, this is, I'd love to think this was my idea, but it wasn't, it was the Oz truck of Mick Williams. So Mick said to me in Sydney, he said, for crying out loud, Glenn, he said, we've got, you know, 46, 48, 52, Put trailers every time, my words not mix, every time we squeeze another six inches on a trailer, we put more free freight on for the, for, for the, for the uh, top of the supply chain. And yet our bunks, look at our cabs and our prime movers. Some of us can stand up and take our pants off. Some of us have to sit on the bunk to do it. And I've said this before, what I'd give to be able to take my pants off standing up in my prime mover would have killed to have that. So you look at the caravan industry and you look in the caravan, they have chemical toilets and they have a shower. Now, bear in mind the width of a chemical toilet. How hard is it to get Australian design rules where we can, <clears throat> excuse me, actually put a chemical toilet in a truck for our truckies for when it's stinking hot outside or when it's pouring down with rain or when we've got women in the trucking industry and could, that's the least we could do with them. Now, how can I get someone to actually say, it's not reinventing the wheel, what a good idea, Senator. How can we work with the trucking industry to do that instead of keep making trailers longer to put free freight on? Yeah, um, so, Senator, can I take that on notice and sure. come back to you? Sure. And I, I know I'm serious, but this is where no, we No, no, I, I appreciate yeah. you. We should be going there because, trust me, that would be a wonderful development. Okay. So... Senator McDonald, thank you for your indulgence, and I will follow up on that. Topic. I will follow up to talk about Rod Hanafy and the fine work that he does, and how we can you can probably assist us to try and get the states to understand the man's trying to save lives. Yeah. He's not trying to take a job off a Department of Transport enforcer. Thank, thank you. you, Senator Stoll. Thank you. Um, 
I don't believe there are any other questions for surface transport. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Senator Brown. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Brown. That's all right. No Very sorry about that. Um, Thank you for your indulgence. I wanted to ask some um, questions around the coastal shipping reform. 